Hello and welcome to another episode in the Godot Basics tutorial series. Godot Tutorials is not affiliated with or sponsored by Godot Game Engine. In this episode, we will take a soft look into shaders. A shader is a program or process that runs in the graphics pipeline and tells the computer how to render each pixel. In Godot, we have three different shader types. We have spatial, canvas item, and particles. In this episode, we will only be taking a look at canvas item. Now, the first line in your shader file should be shader underscore type, followed by canvas underscore item, and you have to end your line with a semicolon. When dealing with shaders, we have two different types of shader loops. The first is the fragment loop, and you use the fragment loop when you want to color your image pixels. The second loop is the vertex loop, and you use that to position your vertices. I want to introduce four different types of global variables that shaders come with. The first is color, and this is the output color of your pixels. The second variable is time, and that is the time since the shader has started, not to be confused with a delta time. The third variable is vertex, and that is the position of your vertex. And the fourth is UV, which is your UV coordinate, and it is read only. UV coordinates is probably new, so let me softly introduce this to you. The UV coordinate system is just taking the letters of the U and the letter V and denote those for the axis of your texture. So think of the U as your X axis and the V as your Y axis. Keep in mind that each individual pixel has a coordinate and images are made up of many, many pixels. Let's go ahead and take a look at the UV coordinate system. So over here, we have our texture image. To the top left of our texture image, we have the coordinates 0.0, .0 and 0.0. .0. To the top right corner of our texture image, we have the coordinates 1.0 and 0.0. .0. To the bottom right corner of our texture image, we have the coordinates 1.0 and 1.0. .0. And to the bottom left of our texture image, we have the coordinates 0.0, .0 and 1.0. .0. And all the other pixels in between are a variation between 0.0, .0 and 1.0 .0 in the given U or V axis. Godot comes with many different methods. I'm going to introduce four. The first is the sine method, which takes in a float value. The second is the cosine method. The third is the tangent method. And the last method I want to introduce is the mix method. It takes in two vector four data types as the first two arguments. The last argument will be a float data type value. And with the mix method, you can sort of create, in a sense, moving gradients. And we'll take a look at that later in this episode. Now, when you want to declare variables outside of the vertex loop or the fragment loop, you're going to need to do two things before you start naming your variables. The first is declaring the initialization type. The second is declaring the data type. And then after that, you can create the name of your variable and then assign it a value depending on your initialization type. When dealing with shaders, we do have three different initialization types. You declare these variables when you're outside of the fragment loop and the vertex loop. The first initialization type is the constant type, and it is used to declare a value that never changes. The second type is varying. You use that when you want to declare a value that you wish to send between the vertex and fragment loop. And the last type is uniform, and you use that when you want a value, or rather when you want to pass data into your shader files. Let's go ahead and take a look at an example. In the first example, I wish to create a color variable that holds a vector for data type. So in this case, I declare the initialization type, which is constant, followed by the data type, which in this case is vector four, followed by the name of our variable, which I use the name color white. And then I go ahead and I assign it the data type vector four, and all values are 1.0 because I would like the color white to be assigned to our variable color white to be used in most likely the fragment loop. And you can do the same thing for the other initialization types. This is the initialization type for varying. So varying data type variable name, same thing for uniform. 
initialization type, data type, variable name. Now, when you're declaring a variable inside one of your loops, in this case, either vertex loop or fragment loop, you can omit the initialization type. So in this example, we're declaring our color white again, in this case, vector four, which is our data type, followed by the name of our variable, which is color white. And then we assign it the values of the vector four data type. And we do the same thing for speed, in this case, float, followed by the name of our variable. Now let's go ahead and take a look at an example of creating basic shaders. So in this example, I've already created some basic shaders so we can take a look at the code structure, but let's go ahead and take a look at how to create a shader. So what you're going to want to do is add a sprite onto the scene tree. Go ahead and pick your sprite in the canvas item under material. You're going to click on empty. You're going to pick new shader material. You're going to click on the image inside the material. You're going to get a pop-up. You're going to see shader followed by empty. You're going to go ahead and click on that. Click new shader. Click on the shader text or icon. And the shader editor is going to pop up on your screen. Right now it's giving you an error because it's expecting the shader type. So go ahead and write that. In this case, I went ahead and created the shader type canvas item property, and we're just letting the shader know that we will be dealing with 2D. Now, once you've done that, basically the sky's the limit. There's a lot you can do with shaders. I'm gonna go ahead and add links into the description down below so you can get more into how to create custom shaders in your games. But in this case, let's do something fairly simple. We want to change the colors of our image. So we're going to go ahead and choose the fragment loop. Remember, open, close bracket. So excuse me, I'm going to have to put the data type because when dealing with shaders, they are expecting the data type of your variables and data type of your functions. Now, in this case, we want to change the color of our sprite. So in this case, we're going to use the global variable color and it takes in a vec for data type. And in this case, let's say we want to change it to all black. So as you can see here in one line, we basically were able to change the color of our sprite image from white to black. I'm going to go ahead and turn this invisible and we're going to look at a simple example. So in this case, on our screen, we can see a image. It's basically our same white square image. But this time inside of our fragment loop, we decided to use the UV global variable. And the UV variable is a vector two data type. So it basically holds our values from the U axis and the V axis, which is the X and Y. And as you can see here on the bottom right, our coordinate systems 1.0 and 1.0. And so if we were to replace that here, you'll notice that everything's white. But because we're using the UV variable, it does something special when we combine it into a vector four. It's basically allowing us to paint each individual pixel. So as you can see here, bottom right is white, top left, which again is 0.0 and 0.0 will be blue. And so you can see that we're painting our colors based on the ranges of 0.0 and 1.0. And that's how we're able to get this gradient color image. So let's take a look at a more complicated example. In this case, I have a simple white image, but it's oscillating between white and blue or a darker shade of blue. And in this case, I created two constant values, color one and color two, in this case, white and a shade of blue. Inside of our fragment loop, we are basically assigning time inside of our sign method and assigning that to a time variable. We're also making sure that time is not less than zero because since sign goes from positive to negative back to positive, we won't be able to change colors quite quickly. We're going to have a little pause until we get back into the positive range and to make sure that we stay positive all the time. In this case, we're making sure that if time is less than zero, then we just inverse back our time value into positive range again. And then after that, we use the mix method onto our global color variable. In this case, color one, which is white, color two, which is our dark shade of blue, and then time. And with this method, we are able to get this effect. Right now, it doesn't seem like anything, but imagine you have something like an injury effect. So let's go ahead and change that to red. And it's a little slow. So what we can do is in fact, multiply our time by a value to speed it up. And you can see we have this flashing effect. And so you can do quite a lot of things with shaders that you normally wouldn't be able to do through your GD file. Certain things, not all things. 
Lastly, let's go ahead and take a look at an example when dealing with the vertex loop. So in this case, we declare our vertex loop with the void or data type because our loop isn't returning back anything. We use the global vertex variable and we add onto it a vector to data type because we're only dealing in a 2D coordinate system in the X axis. Notice how we're using cosine. It doesn't matter what we really use. We could use sine as well. We're just changing how it starts, but ultimately it still gives us the same effect. But regardless whether you use cosine or sine, we pass in the value time inside of it. We multiply it by the distance in pixels. We would like to see our image moving. In this case, I have 1000, but I could change that to 100 and notice how we're only moving 100 pixels. And of course, I don't want to move in the Y axis direction, so I left that to zero. But you could add things here as well in order to give different moving effects. So in this case, if I were to change this into sign, you can see how we're sort of moving in a circle. If I make these values bigger, it will be a bigger circle. Let me zoom out. There you go, bigger circle. And as you can see, through one line of code, we were able to move our image around. But I want you to notice something here. Even though our image is moving around, notice how our node is still positioned here. And so even though we're moving, we're moving in relation to our node position where our image should be had we turned this off. So let me go ahead and just comment that out so you can see where our image is placed. So our image is placed here. Our borders are there. Our collision detection will be here in this box, but our sprite image is being painted around that. So something to keep in mind. Well, that's all I have for you in this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for clicking the like button and thank you for clicking the subscribe button. I'm going to go ahead and upload this onto GitHub so please feel free to click on that in the description down below. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Have an amazing day.